All right, uh, thanks, Sam. Um, I'm just going to jump right into this. Uh, so uh, consider a square. Uh, let's say this square is one inch across. Uh, so let's set up a scale. And if we were to unroll this square on the scale, the tip of the square would land right on four, which should make sense. If a square is one inch across, it should be four inches around. Uh, so now let's do the same thing, but with a circle. So if a circle is one inch in diameter and we unroll it, the tip of it lands pretty close to three, uh, it looks like. Um, and as Ron explained, uh, three was actually a pretty uh, standard historical guess for the circumference of a circle. There's this passage from the Bible which claims that a circular lake is uh, three times further around than it is across. But if we zoom in, we can see that's not exactly right. Uh, this distance, which we call pi, is actually just a little extra bit more than three. Uh, so we call this pi, and this talk is called Pi, the story of an extra little bit. Because for the last 2,000 years, people have been trying to figure out how to describe this extra little amount. And it turns out to be a really difficult quantity uh, to describe. So let's see if we can get a little more specific. Here's the number line. And there's pi, uh, kind of near 3. Um, and if we zoom in, uh, well, to first approximation, we could say pi is 3 plus an extra little bit. Uh, and if we wanted to get more specific about that extra little bit, we can see those white points there are 2, 3, and 4. And if we take the space between those numbers and we divide it up into 10 evenly spaced lines, we can see that pi is just a little bit more than 10% of the way from 3 to 4. So in decimal terms, we can get more specific and say pi is about 3.1. But you'll notice it's not exactly on 3.1. It's actually got a little extra, extra bit more than that. So if we zoom in still further, um, again, that mark is 3.1 uh, up to 3.2. We can subdivide that space into tenths, and we can see that pi is just a little bit past the 4 marker. So we can get a little more accurate and say pi is 3.14. But once again, it's not exactly on 4. There's still an extra, extra, extra little tiny bit. Uh, so if we zoom in again, um, we can get another point. You can kind of see what's happening here. Uh, we get 3.141. And if we zoom in a little more, we get 3.1415. And I think you know this is actually going to go on forever. It's never going to land exactly on a mark. Uh, pi is this funny kind of number where you'd actually have to talk forever in order to say specifically what it is. Um, so this is a, a talk about pi. What I, what I really want to talk about is not so much these digits, uh, but the question of how do we figure out what these digits are. So for 2,000 years, people have been coming up with really ingenious schemes for figuring out these numbers. And each of these methods is uh, really lovely in its own way. So I kind of just wanted to take this talk to present some of them to you. Uh, the first strategy for calculating the digits of pi is due to Archimedes, as uh, Ron was explaining. And this method is based on three observations. So to get at what those are, let's go back to our circle and our square. And we know that the circle has less distance around uh, than the square. And you, you can kind of see why, right? If you were walking around the circle, uh, it, would also, it would take you less time than walking around the square, because obviously you're kind of cutting every corner as you go around. Um, but now consider a square that's sized to fit inside the circle. And you can see this is going to have a smaller distance around than the circle for kind of a similar reason, right? You're still sort of cutting every corner. So if you unroll these on the number line, the big square is going to have the longest distance, the small square is going to have the shortest distance, and pi, whatever it is, is going to be somewhere in between those two. So if you use the Pythagorean theorem, you can figure out the distance around these squares. Uh, and that turns out to be that pi is somewhere between 2.82 and 4. Um, so you have a kind of upper and lower bound. Th this isn't a very good estimate, but um, it's a start. So that's, that's the first observation for Archimedes' method. Uh, the second observation is that if instead of using a four-sided polygon, a square, we used a polygon with more sides, uh, like 6, we can see that the inner and outer polygons actually hug the curve of the circle a little more tightly. So if we unroll these, we're actually going to get a tighter upper and lower bound for pi. If we calculate that, we see that with a six-sided polygon, we calculate that pi is somewhere between 3 and 3.46. So the second observation is that if you use more sides on your polygon, you can get a, you can get a more accurate approximation for pi. So you know, in principle, you could start over and do it with a tenagon or something like that. But the third observation that Archimedes made was that there, there's actually a trick to this. So this is the estimate we got by calculating with a polygon that had six sides. And if you know this estimate, there's actually a way to go directly from this estimate 
to the estimate you'd get from a polygon with twice as many sides. So we can go directly from a sixagon to the estimate we'd get from a 12agon. And you can apply this procedure over and over and over again. So we can go directly from a 12agon estimate to a 24agon, from a 24agon to a 48agon, from a 48agon to a 96agon. And for some reason, this is as far as Archimedes went. But in principle, if you wanted more digits of pi, you could just keep doing this over and over and over again. Um, and it's worth remembering that he, he, he was actually doing this with Roman numerals. So he didn't have any idea about the concept of zero. He didn't have any standard <laughs> method for arithmetic. But amazingly, he was still able to specify pi to an accuracy of what we would now say is uh, two decimal places. So you know, for about 2,000 years, this polygon method was really <laughs> the only game in town. Like, no one could really figure out another way of calculating the digits of pi. Uh, so when we made progress on uh, knowing the digits of pi, it was because someone sat down and just did a marathon calculating session with absurdly many-sided uh, polygons. So uh, in 480, uh, father and son uh, team in China figured out pi to seven digits using a 12,288-agon. Uh, Ron mentioned Ludolf von Kuhlen, who got to 35 digits with a 2 to the 62 agon, which ended up on his tombstone. And, and actually, for a while, uh, pi was actually known as the Ludolfine constant. Um, he was beaten about 30 years later, or 15 years later, by Christopher Greenberger, who got to 38 digits with a 10 to the 40 agon. Um, and I think Greenberger might have been one of the last people to calculate pi using the polygon method because what happened next is we discovered calculus and people started coming up with all kinds of crazy ways uh, to calculate pi. And all of the methods I'm going to show you are just like the Archimedes method in that it's an infinite sequence of steps you take which get you closer and closer to pi. So here's an infinite sequence of steps you can take to calculate pi. Start with 4 over 1 and we're going to subtract something from this, uh, the fraction 4 thirds. And then we're going to add something to that, uh, the fraction 4 fifths. And then we're going to subtract 4 sevenths. And you can see there's kind of a pattern developing here. Uh, it's a sequence of alternating added or subtracted fractions, which all have 4 on the top and have all of the odd numbers uh, in sequence along the bottom. And it turns out that this alternating sum gets closer and closer to pi. Um, this is known as the Madhava method. It was discovered in the Middle Ages in India and then was rediscovered in Europe about 300 years. 300 years later. Um, so here's what this one looks like in practice. So there's the sum across the top. That first number, 4 over 1, is equal to 4. So at step 1, our estimate for pi is 4, which is obviously too big. But luckily, we're going to subtract something. We subtract 4 thirds from that. And that takes us down to 2.66, which is too small. But now we're going to add 4 fifths to that. And that brings us up to uh, 3.466. So we're getting closer to pi with each step. So I'm going to let this run. And the thing I'd like you to pay attention to is just focus on the pi in the middle there and notice how this marker gets closer and closer to pi with each step. And in fact, pi is the ultimate destination of this process. Uh, so here's another way to calculate pi. Take uh, pairs of even numbers and also pairs of odd numbers, but with just a single one, and then kind of zipper them together into this sequence of fractions and multiply all those fractions together and then double that, and this turns out to equal pi. Uh, this is known as the Wallace method. It was discovered in 1655 by John Wallace. Um, and here's what this one looks like in practice. Uh, you start with 2, and you multiply by 2 over 1, which brings it up to 4. So I'm going to run this one again, but now we're actually just going to keep up with this marker as it descends towards pi. And I think the, the thing to notice is this slow and steady pace with which it inexorably <laughs> approaches uh, the number pi. So after eight steps, we get to 3.3437. So we're approaching pi very slowly, right? Um, the Madhava method also only got to 3.017 after eight steps. So we're going to have to do hundreds of steps before we start getting the first few decimal places of pi. So these are like, it's cute that these work technically, but they're kind of useless <laughs> from a practical perspective. We're not just looking for methods of calculating pi, we're looking for methods that are reasonably fast. So uh, here's a slightly faster way of calculating pi. Start with 3, and then again, we're going to add and subtract a series of things. Uh, these are all going to be fractions, which will all have 4 at the top. The first fraction will have 2 times 3 times 4 at the bottom. The next one will have 4 times 5 times 6. The next one will have 6 times 7 times 8. So the pattern here is that you just have these uh, products of sequential, three sequential numbers along the bottom. Uh, this is known as the Nilakantha method. It was discovered around 1500, also in India. And here's what this one looks like in practice. It starts out almost on top of pi. 
Uh, and I'm going to let this one run. And the thing to notice here is that it's significantly faster um, than the Wallace method. After one step, we get to 3.166. And this is how far the Madava method got after eight steps. So we're already making significantly more progress uh, with this method. So if we let it run, you can see that it now zooms down towards pi much, much faster than, say, the Wallace method. After eight steps, we get to 3.14207. And just for reference, this is the uh, upper and lower bound that Archimedes found with the 96 agon. So th this method is roughly competitive with the polygon method. Um, here's a cool one. If you take 2 and multiply it by 2 over the square root of 2, and then multiply that by 2 over the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2, and multiply that by 2 over the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2 plus the square root of 2, um, this gets closer and closer to pi. So with each step, we're just kind of sneaking another plus square root of 2 under the square root sign. Um, and this ends up equaling pi. And actually, this one, if you write it out, it starts to take on this beautiful like musical staff quality. Uh, this is known as the Viet method. Um, and this one is particularly fast. Uh, so you start out at 2, and then when you multiply by 2 over square root of 2, um, that gets you a little closer to pi. I an interesting thing about this one is that rather than jumping back and forth, it actually sneaks up on pi from the left. Um, and this one, after 8 steps, gets you to 3.14151. Uh, so the Nilakantha method only got this far after 8 steps. So uh, the Viet method is, has twice as many significant digits of pi as uh, the Nilakantha at this stage. So anyway, there's this whole bumper crop of new methods for calculating pi that started to get discovered. And often when we broke new records for pi calculations, it was because someone was showing off a new method that they had discovered. Um, so one of my favorite stories from ta this time, this is William Shanks. And he spent about 20 years uh, calculating the digits of pi on and off. And he calculated them out to 707 digits. Uh, but about 50 years later, it was discovered that he made a mistake at 527, and, and every digit after that is wrong. So he spent years of his life calculating meaningless, incorrect digits for pi, which is a hazard of this hobby, uh, I suppose. So the next significant thing that happened in terms of our ability to calculate the digits of pi was that this person um, existed. This is Srinivasa Ramanujan. He was a self-taught mathematical prodigy from southern India. And in the early 20th century, he traveled to Cambridge and did some of the most groundbreaking, mind-bending number theory uh, that's ever been done. Ramanujan had this extraordinary kind of numerical vision where he could uh, conceive of a formula like this, and he would claim that he could perceive somehow that this was equivalent to pi. And normally, um, well, first of all, if you do much math, like this is a really psychedelic looking equation. There's a lot of stuff stuck together in ways that you don't normally see. And usually a mathematician will like uh, derive a formula like this or present a proof. Um, but a lot of Ramanujan's results were actually divinely inspired. He said that his goddess Namagiri would reveal these formulas to him in visions. Um, and if you actually calculate this, it very much does seem to produce the digits of pi. But nobody, including Ramanujan, could explain why it worked. Um, and he discovered this in 1910. And it took until the 1980s for our mathematics to become sophisticated enough that we could confirm this is indeed an exact formula for pi and not just a really good seeming approximation. Uh, so this is known as the Ramanujan formula. And one thing I learned about the Ramanujan formula when I was making this talk is that it is really hard to animate because it is very fast. Uh, this produces an additional eight digits of pi with each step. Um, so if you try and animate that, it kind of just looks like a blur. <laughs> and then also, I was trying to do these out to eight steps, and it turned out that exceeded the zoom range of the program I was using to make these animations. So I was having a kind of a comically hard time <laughs> trying to animate this one. So in 1988, uh, a, a pair of uh, Ukrainian-American brothers named the Chudnovskys figured out a way to turbocharge Ramanujan's formula and came up with this crazy thing. So this thing produces an additional 14 digits of pi with each step. Um, these guys are kind of interesting characters. Not only did they come up with the Chunovsky brother algorithm, algorithm, but they were actually pioneers in using modern supercomputers to do extremely deep uh, calculations of pi. One of them had an apartment on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, and they just started filling up the apartment with like hard drives and pieces of supercomputer hardware that they could get their hands on. And they eventually completely filled the apartment with computer. They had air conditioners in every window trying to keep the thing cool, and they were trying to keep it a secret from the landlord. Um, and the skunk works got so complex after a while that they were afraid to shut it off because they didn't think they could ever get it turned back on again. 
But for a while, these guys were consistently the record breakers. They were the first people to get to a billion digits. Um, I think they got up to about four billion uh, on their own. And that algorithm, the Chunovsky brothers algorithm, is still one of the main tools we use to this day in doing uh, deep calculations of pi. And the continued relevance of that algorithm is kind of interesting because it's not actually the fastest method of calculating pi that we know about. Uh, for instance, in the 1970s, we started discovering a new class of algorithm for calculating pi. One example of this is what's known as the Solomon-Brent algorithm. Uh, and I, I don't actually have the, the formula for this one here. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's really not that, that complicated. And it ends up calculating pi in kind of an interesting way. So after the first step, you've only got one accurate digit of pi. Uh, after two steps, you get up to four digits. Uh, after three steps, you get up to nine digits. So it, it starts off really slow. But what's happening is with each step, you're getting approximately twice as many digits as you had before. So if you continue in this way, after eight steps, you get up to 347 digits of pi. And you know how these things accumulate. If you, if you go to 24 steps, that'll get you up to 45 million digits of pi. So you can get really deep into pi after only a few steps. Um, the problem with this one is that if you're going <laughs> to calculate 45 million digits of pi, you need to be working with 45 million digits of accuracy from the beginning. So the amount of computer memory you need in order to execute this, the amount of like digital scratch paper necessary to carry out this calculation starts to get really exorbitant. Uh, so it's not often practical for really deep calculations of pi. So in terms of methods for calculating pi, there seems to be kind of a trade-off. You have examples like these, which are very slow but trivially easy to compute step after step after step. And then at the other end of the spectrum, you have things like the Solomon-Brent algorithm, which gets very deep into pi very quickly, um, but it requires an enormous overhead in terms of computational resources uh, in order to carry it out. And then these ones in the middle, I want to say they're like just right. Um, you can bite off a good chunk of pi with each step, but your uh, material resources don't get that much out of hand. Um, as maybe a final thought, I, I just want to say, you know, Ron pointed out that we don't really need more than 40 digits of pi to calculate the circumference of the universe to the accuracy of a hydrogen atom. So in physical terms, these digits don't mean an awful lot and are not especially useful to us in empirical, practical terms. But it does seem to be very much a feature of reality that they exist. They're very specific, and they go on forever. And we have access to them, not because we're doing any kinds of experiments, but because we can just sit and think carefully and logically about the properties and relationships of numbers. And I think this is a really surprising and beautiful thing about mathematics. And I think this uh, set of algorithms really illustrates the, the kind of creativity and diversity in the human endeavor to sort of uh, figure out this number. And I, I, um, so that's, that's what these represent to me.